So um, we're going to have a very intimate conversation, but a very exciting one, yet and still, around diversity and inclusion. Um, so I think that diversity has been like this taboo topic for a very long time. And I think now people are starting to get a lot more confident in the conversation. However, I do a lot of travels and I notice that people are still not really sure what it means, right? So what I'm saying by that is I think the limitations become age, sex, gender, race. And then everything beyond that is like, don't talk about it, right? And anything that is normally not seen as diversity, but I can tell you that it absolutely is, we just don't talk about it at all, right? So my conversation with you is going to be one that you can not only use within the Drupal community, right? And everything that you all do. I've been having so much fun hanging out with you all. I can't wait for barbecue later. I saw a bear earlier. Didn't prefer that part, but, you know, it happens. Um, but what I plan on doing is making sure you also know that you can use this information in your communities, in your families, in your homes, your churches, all those things. Um, my name is Mariah Manuel Berry. Um, I am the CEO and founder of Knowledge Career Experts, LLC. Uh, my company is built off of three key pillars. And you'll see them up there, mentorship, professional development, and culture. And the conversation that we're gonna have today is focused around that culture piece, right? Um, I built the company off of these three pillars because after having years of travel, networking, uh, training people, my background is in human resource development as well as learning and development. What I noticed is that people were using these three key pillars to either increase their wealth, improve their career experiences, or just have an overall better business practices. So what I realized is like, okay, these are topics that I can use, but they're ones that I should be sharing with other people. Um, so yeah, so that's the reason why I use them. Now. When we go deeper into our conversation, and even before we get really started, I wanna make sure we're on the same page. I don't care if it's only three people here, 300 people. I wanna make sure that we understand this is a co-creation process. Because sure, fellow teacher, learner, and developer, you understand that we cannot do this if I'm up here as a talking head and you all are down there, right? We have to work together. And the way that we work together is, the first thing is, I want to make sure you understand I'm making a commitment to you. I'm going to give you all of me. I'm going to share anything that I have, any resources, anything that I can give to help you to be better. But not only that, I'm going to challenge you, but I'm not going to discredit you. I'm going to honor you as a person. I'm going to honor our time together. And I'm going to make sure that you all feel confident and comfortable leaving this role. If you leave with ideas, I've done my part, right? The other thing, though, is you have to make a commitment to you. Especially now that I can see you all, right? First, taking notes, being engaged, right? This is a fun time, it's a safe space, and I want you to be vulnerable, right? So that it actually works. But the other thing is making sure that you understand that, well, again, the information we use here, you can use out there, right? So you should be able to leave with something. Commitment to each other? Yes, we're good? Yes. yes. All right, okay, all right. Probably, probably worth it. Even better. That means we're about to. That, we're about to get some tears, right? All right. I'm going to do all the things. Okay. All right. So, with that being said, let's get into the mind shift. I want y'all to do something. Everybody pull out a piece of paper. No paper. No paper. It's okay. You 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 know each other. You know what? Hand us. Share the paper. There we go. Do you also pet? Oh, the unprepared teacher. Oh, no. I, I have my own. Left up. Hey, I got my coffee. <laughs> you did. Yes. You're ready for the coffee. I got pants. Exactly. Oh, oh wait. You got pants. I have time <laughs> So basically, we need to survive. We're yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right? We're in a survival mode. Okay. 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 I thank you for that. Uh, we can take those together. Super, super helpful. And these, these do tear off if you don't put the right way. Oh, yeah, there's some good things. But there's one. <laughs> no, I think we're good. I, I think we're good. Thank you. All right, here we go. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to write down three descriptors of yourself. And it could be anything, right? So if I was writing this down today, I would probably put why 
mother Christian. Because those are the three things that pops out of my head. But any three things, any three ways that you describe yourself. I want to hear more about how you're describing that for you. Oh, okay. So, uh, we got bubbling personality. Okay. I think I am very just sociable, likable. Um, I think when I walk into a room and I engage with someone, they are happy. Oh, that's amazing. Give her a round of applause, please. Even, even in this room. Even in this room. Make sure you have that. Okay. Who else wants to share? I'll go. Okay, go ahead. Passionate, friendly, and collaborative. Okay, tell us about that middle one. Um, friendly. I seem to make friends in line, holding doors open <laughs> in very random situations. Everywhere you go, you don't know a stranger, you have a friend. Yeah, I get yeah, that. Yeah, that's definitely me. Okay. That's literally a joke. <laughs> okay, amazing. All right, cool. So, now here's the challenging part. Cross one out. Well, maybe it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be the way you all just crossed that thing out. <laughs> okay, share with us which one did you cross out and why? Well, I crossed out tall because it's so basic. Well, and it's also kind of obvious. Like, I mean, the people mentioned should be like, he's tall. In a, in a you know, remote only workforce, it's not so obvious. <gasps> oh, come on now. Well, yeah, that's good. But it's a thing. It and is it's a thing. thing I'm aware of when I'm moving through space, too. I was talking to people at dinner last night, and one of them was a woman who was like five foot. Uh huh. And, and I was conscious to make sure I was giving her space mm. because I don't want her. You know. I can accidentally intimidate people just because of, I mean, I, I saw sorry, I saw two people yesterday having a conversation, and they were both taller than me, and that's really I'm six three. You don't mind people taller than me very much. That is interesting. So, hey. Very interesting. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Good job. Right. All right. Okay. All right. Anybody else want to share what they cross out? Uh, empathetic. Oh, really? Okay. Tell us why. Um, I don't know. I think empathy is. Take pictures. That's your word. I set my water bottle somewhere. Did I mention I was friendly? Yeah, I saw. I saw. I noticed. Okay. <laughs> um, I think. You know, empathy is one of those things that I can turn off and on. Not that I'm like a sociopath. Right. Um, <laughs> or anything. Well, 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 yeah. But, you know, I think, you know, I reach a certain level and then I'm less empathetic. And, mm. and it's just kind of human nature. There's, Got it. Got it. Yeah, that's, I get that. I get that. I get that in leadership. Uh, are you a leader by any chance in your own? Technically. Technically you are. Technically. Technically. I, got, I got told I was a leader. Yes. I was like, okay. Uh-huh. I get that. Because a lot of leaders go through what I call leadership burnout. It's a real thing. People don't talk about it that often because they assume you're a leader, you can handle it, keep going, you'll be okay. But I get that threshold of empathy because what about me, right? I get that. Okay, cool. Go ahead. Please. No, this so is the open other, conversation. So, so the, other, the other issue with empathy, and I talked about this a couple times. Hmm. Is empathy is two edged sword because if you empathize with person A, you might then align mm -hmm. with them again, person B. There we go. You have to be very, very aware yep. of where your normal empathy is lying. Normal empathy is lying, typically people who are like you. Yep. There we go. Unconscious bias. Yeah. Yeah. 
right? The first one is the hardest, which is why I usually stay there a little bit longer. So let's get into the first one. Oh, let's talk about this. Equality versus equity. Anybody ever heard of this? Okay, tell me. Tell me. Tell me. This is open discussion. Tell me more. So uh, equality is sort of like everyone gets the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's a piece of bread, right, or a loaf of bread, you'll get a loaf of bread, you'll get a loaf of bread, you'll get a loaf of bread. That doesn't take into account everyone's different situations. There we go. That's equity. So he might not need that piece of bread because he might already have a meal. Mm -hmm. Versus she might need more bread because she has to feed X, Y, and, you know, people. Or he might not need as much or more. Or you won't really take into account the various situations people are in. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, that's equity. When you are meeting people where they are with all their various different backgrounds, that's what you need to do. Yeah. And there's a lot of the future. I love it. I love that definition. And I love that you personalize it with food. Let me tell you, I use food for every analogy that I can. I don't care if it's a big spanner, so I'm like, yeah, food, everybody relates to that. Because it also made me think of, what if I have dietary restrictions? Mm -hmm. So now you just give me something that you thought was going to sustain me yep. and give me, but it, because I can't even, right? So yeah, so it's that idea. Here's a good picture a visual of equality versus equity. And it, it definitely hits exactly what you said, right? It's the idea that if I give everybody the same thing and the person on the end doesn't need anything, so I didn't give it to them, you'll think, okay, well that's, that's equity. Everybody's getting everything. When in fact, I need a little bit more because of my height difference. See what I did there? See what I did there, <laughs> right? So it makes sense for you to get the more that you need. Right? And it doesn't take away from anybody else. And I think that's the piece that we leave off when we think about equity. I notice that when I go into organizations and say, for instance, they're like, I want to increase my diversity pipeline. I want more diverse people in the pool. You got to consider the people who've been here with you. Right? So if you tell me as a woman, let's say, for instance, hypothetically, I'm a woman working for a company and it's woman based and it's woman owned and it's woman, woman, woman. And one day the CEO says, hey, we want to have more men added to this company. Now, yeah, that sounds great. And of course, who wouldn't want you know, to have a diverse group? But what does that mean for the women who've been here? Does that mean that we get excluded out? So equity, inclusivity, all those things need to think about where we are today. OK, so let's talk about increased awareness, which is my first key. So increased awareness looks like First, being able to, I, I always put it in the terms of research, experience, and reflection. But when I say research, I mean research. I mean being able to constantly, in a, in a thoughtful way, say, I actually know the thing a little bit more than I did before. It looks like reading books, podcasts. Um, movies. I, I think there are so many ways that lifelong learning can happen and research becomes so very important. The second one, which is experience, is the hardest because it means that you don't just say, I read the book on African Americans, so now I know African Americans. I know what they do, I know what they don't do. I read the book on, um, you know, neurodiversity. So anytime I'm around somebody who's neurodiverse, I know what to say, I know what they don't need, I know what they like, I know, because there is still diversity even in the thing. So it's good to do the research, but what I always challenge people is increasing awareness means that you actually go and experience it. And the last thing is reflect. So this is when you ask yourself, and I want you all to write this question, who was I prior versus who I am so prior to the research and experiences that you had, who were you? And then after, who did you become? How did things change for you? I'll give you an example of what I'm next to you. So I was watching a Lifetime movie. Lifetime? Anybody have a Lifetime? Mm -hmm. Have a Lifetime movie? Okay. No, not, okay, we're so <laughs> Sorry, so you're asleep, don't play. All right, so yeah, Lifetime movie, right? So let me, we really want to help them out this Lifetime movie. Right? So Lifetime movie. Oh, I know what they are. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I don't know why. All right, all right, all right. Generally speaking. You see one, you see most of them. Oh, come on, come on now. 
That's Hallmark. That's Hallmark, right? So the Lifetime movies, generally what happens to things over driving crazy, um, is that it is always a true story. That's the first thing you need to understand about Lifetime movies. It's based on a true story, right? So I was watching this Lifetime movie, and the husband and wife, their daughter goes missing. So, dun dun dun, right? So they go into the police station, and they get in the police station and say, our daughter's gone missing, we need help to find our daughter. Now, if you watch any movie, or any show for that matter, what's generally the response for person gone missing? 24 hours. 24 hours, you gotta wait 24 hours, right? Cause maybe they'll come back, you know, maybe they're just out for a long day. 24 hours, right? So of course, mother leaves, father leaves. They say, okay, we'll be fine. Be a little more thoughtful of the outcome, right? Hopeful, I should say. They say they go back. Daughter's still gone. She hasn't come back. This police officer was like, maybe she was her boyfriend. Wait a minute, where did a boyfriend come from, right? Maybe she ran away, right? It became very clear that he was not empathetic at all, that he definitely had no intention of helping this family. And then Mother Vera came out. Mother Vera's like, you gotta help me. My daughter's missing, this is important. I need this help, I need the support. And then she eventually leaves. And when she leaves, she starts to post flyers and tell everybody in the neighborhood and she's looking for her daughter, right, who is missing. She finds this organization, and this organization is filled with other individuals who aren't getting the same support when their relatives or family or friends go missing. By the end of the movie, of course, the organization and her together can find the daughter. Turns out it was this whole ring of women going missing in the area, right? So she didn't crack the case, so kudos to the mother, because she did, right? But it was just this whole experience. And then at the end of the movie, they say, based on a true story, and they say, if you know anyone who's gone missing, contact black and missing. And that's when it piqued my interest. So I was like, the podcast. black and missing? I said, nah, I didn't even know. And I'm black, I'm not missing, but I'm black, right? I've never heard of this organization before. And I've never been, um, honestly, I've never had anyone go missing in my life. So I, I probably wouldn't have needed the resource, but the fact that it's there. Turns out, it's an entire epidemic of when people of color or individuals go missing, they don't receive the same support as their counterpart. So then I started to do some research. So I'm online, like, black and missing, okay? I'm on their social media pages, I'm trying to figure out what they do, what they're, what's important to them, where they are. Turns out they're all over. Then I start to say, I need to have some experiences. I reach out to the CEO, right, on LinkedIn, Stalker, right? So I'm like, hey, you know, black and missing. I read it, and I'm like really intrigued, right? So I'm attending like their virtual events. I'm trying. I'm really, you know, into this. But then I say, what can I do? Now that I've done the research, and I've had these experiences, and I feel tied to these people, even though I've never had anybody missing, what can I do? So what I decided is that every single time I have a speaking engagement, anytime I make money from anything, training, consulting within this organization, a portion goes to black and missing. Because I want to put my money where my mouth goes. I didn't want to just say, I learned this new thing, it's cool, here's this thing. I mean, I get to share it. So if you didn't know about black and missing, now you do know about black and missing. So that's what I mean. When I'm saying, when I'm saying you all do research and experience and reflect, I'm saying, do the research, go have the experiences, and then reflect. And then in that reflection, figure out if there's something you can do. I'm not about talking about doing it, but let's do it. Anybody ever seen four layers of diversity? Or identity, I should say? Anybody seen this chart before? Mm -mm. I love this chart. So this chart introduces you to something that you probably haven't seen before, and it also really expands your knowledge around diversity. So, the first section, okay, there we go. Don't drive me crazy. I got it. Thank you. The first section, this primary section, section is probably the things you've heard of, right? Age, race, gender, sexual orientation. Those are our normal things, right? This section here, this secondary section, is geographic location, appearance, working style, language, okay? It gets a little bit deeper. 
This section here is about organizational, network, work experience, tenure, location. And then further out, you start to talk about cultural. Being versus doing, mm, right? Time, conflict resolution. When you all are looking at this, I want you to choose one thing that you probably didn't think would be tied to diversity. And write it down on your paper. What's one topic on here you're like, I would never tie that to diversity. <laughs> okay, everybody done? Yeah. All right, cool, let's share. All right, so who wants to go first? I'll go. Okay. Union affiliation. <gasps> mm. Tell me more of why you wouldn't normally think that's tied to diversity. So I'm a trade unionist by, by makeup. Um, I've been in multiple unions. I grew up in the union movement. My dad was the secretary of his local. I, I am union born and bred. Yes. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I would never have thought that that was an, a diversity issue. Oh, mm. oh, yeah. oh, oh. I, I have, as a manager, received training as to how to spot a, uh, a fake job applicant who is actually a union mole trying to trick the company into saying something anti-union during the hiring process so they can sue us. And I would go a step well, further. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But yeah. not only that, think that about it. Starbucks true. has gone through it. The hospital system has gone through it. Where when you think of, because you've been a part of it, obviously I have to, my mother, right? So she's born and bred as well. Yeah. Uh, is that what is diversity, right? Diversity is the idea of, yes, bringing people together, but it's also their differences. It's also honoring their affiliations, who they are, and all those things. Absolutely, the union does that. I've been on both ends. I've been in the union, and I've been a leader of union employees. So I know that they do have differences, and I know how to honor both in those experiences. Right to work state. Yeah. We are, yes. Thankfully, yes. not any longer. Yes. So, yeah, so, yeah, so diversity absolutely lives there. Okay? Who else? Anybody else want to share? Flexible or structured. Okay. Tell me why you would normally put that into the topic of diversity or why you didn't. Interesting, interesting. Of the things on there, that's the one that didn't occur to me. Because that, it's a personal preference. Or have it. Like, do you want a structured environment or a flexible environment? And it's something that, that I think we're aware of, but I don't I, I just want to put it in the diversity. Ooh, I'm going to. cooperation context. Okay, I'm going to go deeper. Okay. Are you saying that diversity work or thoughts or, you know, nothing, like we're not stuck to any term, is based on choice? or things that you have the ability to choose from or not choose from? I am not saying that. Okay. So when you think of flexible verse or structure, yeah. I heard you say that it's a choice. A choice or a preference for most, yeah. That's the way I view it. Mm -hmm. And that's why it didn't occur to me to think of it. Okay. See, I feel like I was about to say, you about to say something, I'm going to let you get in there. Go ahead. It's that I didn't choose anything from cultural. I, ch I chose high here. But I guess I was looking at the cultural stuff, and I was thinking, like, almost like that makes perfect sense. And for me, it's the flexible versus structure. I think because my father's Nigerian. My mother ain't. I'm not. I'm not. She's not. She's not. Right. Um, but, but like in terms of flexible structure, I would say that my my mother had a certain structure because of her environment. You know, it's blue collar workers. It's this and that. My father did not have that because he grew up in civil war. It was a bit different. Mm -hmm. And for me, the flexibility or structure, it seemed inherently cultural just because I had those two different experiences. So, look, I get what you mean in that it doesn't seem like it should because it seems that like you get to choose that. But then I remember going to my father's house. I don't get to choose the way at all. Act, like, in any way, shape, or form, the way I, I guess I act. It's almost like second nature. Yes. 
or, or the way he keeps his house or runs his house or anything like that. So it, it's like I'm swept in a tide. Mm, mm -hmm. And that's what I was going to say is, is I love how you brought it out and I challenged you because I was like, huh, let me make sure I understand your thought process. Because I would say even in a work environment, you don't always have a choice. <laughs> Going back if it's a union, right? So if you're brought into a union environment, and that's usually why people make that decision of, do I want to stay in a union or not? Is because you, or salary versus hourly, right? So some people who are hourly employees think, well, man, I wish I could just go to lunch and not have to clock in and clock out, you know, like, and they battle with that. But it's, it's structured that you are, yes, sometimes choosing, but sometimes you're choosing the job and you're enforcing that structure on you indirectly. So, yeah, I love that. I love that. Go ahead. Thank you for the time my mother. My stepfather is my Alzheimer's care. They got married 30 years ago and there was a conflict. There was a conflict between him and her own children, me, around acceptable behavior. Mm. And he sort of called us out on something stuff that he didn't like and we couldn't have a fight about it. Couldn't have been very advice to him. I had to go back to him and be like, look, we didn't grow up with you. We don't have the life experience. That's it. It's your house. Just tell us what, what you want. Are, yep. Mm hmm And we will obey them. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. But, but we don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that that was a formative piece of that relationship. Yeah. Mm hmm And that's definitely diversity. Definitely is. Yes, ma'am. Um, <laughs> the one that I, the with, with parent family status. Oh yes, and that's good one. And marital relationship status. I'm diversity. It's kind of. I'll give you a good example. Yeah, please. And I'm, and, and I'm, I'm not forgetting. Everybody has to go. Oh, that was just like. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, that's a great one. And, and I'll do it, I'll give my own personal experience. Before having a child, I wanted children, but my career was important. And that could, you could throw that into generation, you could throw that into so many categories as to why my career was so important to me, right? After I got married, of course I wanted children, right? We wanna take a year off, like, you know, you start planning, good structure. We we'll take a year off, we gonna have a baby, and it's gonna happen, and you know, you start to plan your life out. Well, it wasn't happening after three years. Turns out I have PCOS and didn't even know it. And turns out I'm the only one in my family who's had PCOS so nobody else knew what was going on, right? So we went through a process of IVF and things like that. But prior to, to show like this diversity piece, even though that's diversity, constantly I would be at work and they would say, well, you don't have children, so you should be able to stay later, right? Or, uh, we're doing a mom's in this. Bring your child to work. Imagine how I felt with PCOS wanting to have a child. So it's not even like intentional sometimes. Sometimes it's just unconsciously being done. And it's not uh, for the purposes of excluding. It's to be more inclusive to the mother and things like that. But you're not thinking about the non-mother or the non-father, maybe equal, who's in that room. So yeah, so changing your status and now, right? So now I'm at every mommy and me event, right? So, but you know, that happened. All right, I'm gonna let you share. Come on, tell me what you got. Oh, with um, flexibility, I was remembering grow, growing my daughter. Um, <laughs> growing, Yeah, she um, did that. Well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, and having to deal with workplace issues like mm -hmm. suddenly school has decided that they're not open in the morning and we've got a four-hour delay there we go school. there we go i still have to be at work i gotta go to work yes. i have to be there yeah and work was not flexible and i worked for the government Ooh. and it was not flexible nope you didn't have flexibility the way that others would have it you had more structure yes yeah. yes yeah. Okay, Nina, what you got? Any other ones that you, I know you mentioned one. I don't know, I think the, the cultural aspect is just so, it's almost obvious to me, like in mm -hmm. a way that it seems very, but I feel like that's the one that's often sort of overlooked in a way, like yes. time. Time is 
cute. We actually just went to a birthday party, and my mother said, yeah, uh, a party starts at 3. And I'm like, OK, like, I'll start getting ready around 3. And she was like, no, 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 like, it starts at 3. I'm like, mm-hmm, I know. I'll get ready around, like, 3. But she's like, it's a surprise party. I'm like, oh, God, OK. Yeah. <laughs> And it was like, this one was 65, a black woman. And I'm like, I don't know. And we had to wait for like 90 minutes. And I was like, I done told you. Yeah, she but wasn't coming all the time. I right. Like, I knew it wasn't going to happen. Right. So, so, yeah. <laughs> the, the funnier part was that I also knew it wasn't going to happen. But then the family was so, oh, no, you have to be on time because it's a surprise party. And I thought it was really hilarious that we also showed up with all the Africans' families uh, seriously, they were from Cote d'Ivoire and Senegal and Cameroon, and we are all up there before the African Americans arrive. Oh, I, absolutely! I, I know Nigerian time way worse. Way worse. I was way gonna worse. say I've been to weddings, and, so yes. And if I can be on time, yes. Why can't the party girl be there on time? Well, here's the thing. So that is absolutely diversity. It's your relative to time. But also, I work for a global organization, and I work with global clients. You mentioned it earlier. I have people in Europe who I have to talk to every single day. That's a six-hour difference. And sometimes during the year, it's a five-hour difference because I don't know why they did this to themselves, but they shift their hours from five to six-hour difference. I don't, it's crazy, right? So, But it's having that conscious understanding that when I show up, that doesn't mean that they're showing up. I can't schedule a meeting for global at a certain time because I know they won't be there, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, so all these things and more are around diversity. What I'm challenging you with, because of the time that we have, you have a topic. I want you to research it. I'm not gonna check in, but I will if you want me to. You can definitely reach out to me. But I want you to research your topic. Go deeper in it. Think about how is it tied to diversity and maybe even how you may have seen it prior but now that we've had this conversation, you see it a little bit differently. And then experience it, right? So I'm not saying leave your job and go find one of more structure or go find one that is a little you know, less structured, but maybe you challenge yourself in your personal life. Maybe you say, okay, this month, I'm going to create a schedule for myself. Work-life balance, maybe that's something you need to work on. I'm going to say at 8 a.m. I get up every morning and then I do this and that. I'm going to create structure and see how that feels differently. Or maybe you interact with somebody who has more structure, a government worker, a union employee versus not you, all those things, right? And then afterwards, reflect. Who are you now? What changes can you make? What work can you do for Drupal, right? And in your field, considering now what you know to be different. So I'm going to go to the end. Plenty of resources, plenty of information. I'm not going to play the video. I might go back to the video. I don't know. But here are my three keys. Increasing awareness, like I said, is the hardest, but it's also the most important. That is finding out new information and then having that chance to reflect. The second one is embracing your voice to help other people. It is the riskier one, but it is the most important one as well. And the last one is building the community. You can't do this alone. I can tell you right now, once you leave this room, life is going to smack you in the face. And once life hits you, you're like, we had a good conversation. I felt connected with those people. But you have to find a way to keep that world around you in order to, for it to actually work. All right, I want you all to pull out your phones and take a picture of this QR code. This one is actually going to give you the opportunity to give me feedback share your information. I hope that we can connect on LinkedIn. I want to stay together even after I jump on my plane at 4 a.m. tomorrow morning. Ooh. Ah! <laughs> I knew that'll wake you all up. Time. See time? You see what happens? Just, yeah. Yeah. So the code that you're going to use once that QR code come up is three pillars. So if you bring up that it should, if it asks you for a code, use three pillars. If it doesn't ask you for a code, you can just put your name and email in. And I want to hear your thoughts. Give me your feedback. Let me know how this presentation went. Let me know how the conversation went for you. Now, I'm running a special only for this event. And this one is all around AI. So right now, as you all know, AI is like the thing of all things for everybody in the world. 
And what I found was, was that individuals are, yes, intimidated by AI in some cases. Some people don't trust it in some cases. But in my experience, it can be very helpful once you learn how to train it. So for this particular event, I am training individuals on how to use AI to remake or update or recreate in some cases their resume and cover letter. So if you know anybody who may be applying for jobs, it is a scary event right now for a lot of people doing that. Please let them know, share with them my email address and um, I'll definitely make sure that they receive a special discount because you all attended this event. Yeah. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. So I just recently took another job. Okay. And the job before that, I was the only black person. Mm -hmm. The same job, I'm the only black person. Mm -hmm. And I'm realizing I'm getting a little fatigued with always having to be the only black Oh, okay. <laughs> I know your struggle all so well. So, like, this is incredibly useful and in helping me think critically about it. But I also, I'm, I'm in a crossroads. It's like, I want to take back this one, but I do not want them to be seen as the diversity girl or the inclusion girl. Because okay. Because I feel like I will have to feel the questions and have to be, you know, then that's what you become, as you said at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that's what kind of happened the last, my last job. And that's exhausting. It is. So, how would, like, how do you, what would you recommend that I do in that? Like, how do you bring back this learning but do not become the de facto token in the room? Yeah. That's a great question. And I first want to honor, first of all, your vulnerability for sharing. So, thank you for sharing it with me. But I'll go as far as to say, you're not alone. There are plenty of people who do this type of work, the diversity work, HR, just be in HR for a little bit. And you'll start to notice that all of a sudden you become the scapegoat, but you also become the person who, yes, is responsible for a lot of the information, but not appreciate for what you share. So we can continue this conversation one-on-one, -on -one, but what I will always say is important that you're doing is doing what you love. So for example, I love diversity. I love it no matter what. I don't care where I am, I'll do it. I'll do it for free. Let me be clear, <laughs> disclaimer. However, what I've learned was in my experience after a decade of doing this work is I was doing it for free. And I was burning myself out because I wasn't only doing it. I was doing it plus and, right? I was doing the other things, the project management stuff, the training stuff, like and this. Yeah. And what I noticed is, is that people weren't appreciating what I was bringing to the table. So first, I charge, hence my business. So what I would first recommend is that you need to do what you love first. But if you're going to do this type of work, you need to require that you are paid for your work. This isn't free work. This isn't a volunteer thing. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people like to lump diversity work into volunteer work. It is not because you're dealing with people. And people are people. And when you're doing work with people, it is excruciatingly hard. You need resources, you need time, you need support, you need guidance, you need training, you need all those things. Because the other end of that spectrum is you become the token, and if it doesn't work, you become the scapegoat. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's honest. The other thing I would say is I'm data driven, you need to use data. I am too. <laughs> you need to use data. I don't care what anybody say. I love it when people try to challenge me and say, I work with a company and others say, you know, we want to bring you in to do a diversity program. And I say, okay, great. And I'll get there. And I'm like, show me your data. And they're like, what? Yeah, pull them books, right? I need to know where the money is. I need to know where the resources are. I need to know your employee engagement scores. I need to know your turnover. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people don't think that that starts diversity, but it absolutely it is. is. And if you think I'm gonna come in here and do work and not show you that because I came, your numbers got better, yeah. mm -hmm. you got a better way coming. Yeah. So use data. That is your go-to. 
because then that adds the value to why we must pay you mm -hmm. to give you those additional resources and time and energy to do the work if it's important. Last and final thing, oh, you know what? Why am I doing this for you? Why did I just do that to myself? And I did it good too. I got another special prize for you. God, dog it. Okay. The last QR code that I have, I want you to take up your phone really quickly. I want this computer to work. I'm pushing the button. Plug in, plug in. You have to take a picture of this QR code. This QR code is a one page document that I created, and it's literally my steps that I do when I go into organizations. So I put them on a document specifically for you all to share. And of course, it's not going to. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, yeah, you know what? That's even better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, take a picture of the QR code so you can have it.